Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Kirsty Graham. She is research associate at the University of St. Andrews. Her PhD research cataloged the full gestural repertoire of wild bonobos. She examined individual differences in repertoire size and usage. Most importantly, she defined the meaning of each gesture type by de determining the reaction given by the recipient that satisfies the signaler. Understanding meanings or ambiguity of meanings for wild bonobo gestural communication provides insights into the evolution of our own complex communication system and that's what, what we're going to be talking today about. So Dr. Graham, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> okay, great. So let's start with the general question, maybe. What is communication from an evolutionary perspective? So communication, and I suppose the way that I think about communication is having two sides. So there's the signaler who is conveying information, and there's a the recipient who is receiving and interpreting information um, and so the signaler may or may not intend to communicate um, but they are conveying some kind of information so for example like a poisonous frog with bright colorations that color is conveying information about um, their toxicity and then predators being the recipient in this scenario would interpret that information um, that this frog is toxic. So it, communication isn't necessarily intentional. Um, it's more about information being passed um, from a signaler to a recipient. Oh, that, that's interesting because I really thought it had to be intentional in some way. I mean, so just the simple fact that uh, for example, in the case of sexual selection, males and females exhibit certain kinds of traits that are preferred by the opposite sex. I mean, just by them uh, uh, having those traits and others seeing them, they are also communicating. Yeah, they are. They're communicating about their health and their um yeah their potential fitness it's um i i suppose from an animal communication perspective you also there's different um layers that get built in and taken from philosophy and linguistics semiotics um and so there are different ways of conceptualizing communication and so often when we're talking about communication, we think about vocalizations and gestures and facial expressions, but there's also like chemical communication, electrical communication, and yeah, there's this in this passage of information, whether or not it's intentional, um, can also be considered communication. Mm -hmm. So you've studied gestural communication. I, I mean, how far back in evolutionary history can we go and find that kind of communication? I, I mean, because I would imagine that gestures involve mostly hands, right? Yeah, so gestures, um, we actually include all limbs um, okay. and even head. So like head shaking and head nodding, those sorts of movements can also be considered gestural. We're not really sure how far it goes back just because of how we've come about studying it. So um, looking at great ape gestures was really born out of those old ape language studies. Um, first, people tried to teach chimpanzees um, how to speak. That proved challenging because of their vocal apparatus. Um, and then started to teach a wider variety of great apes how to use um, hand yeah, signs um, and gestures and so from that and also from early research um, with chimpanzees um, at Gombe they started to see that chimpanzees were using gestures in the wild and that sort of converged into looking at gestures in great apes and it's only in the past maybe five or six years that we've started going back to look at gestures in other 
um, primate species. There's some evidence of gestures um, in more distantly related species, but we haven't really got a big phylogenetic picture built up yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, are there, could we say that there are some domains where uh, primates use, use gestures, like for example, uh, they use gestures for indicating or communicating information about food, about predators, something like that? Yeah, so vocalizations, to take a step back, are very like widely broadcasted signals. So you'd use a vocalization when you want a, like a wider number of individuals to hear. So vocalizations are often used when as alarm calls when encountering a predator or as food calls to alert others to the presence of some like high value um, food items. So vocalizations being used to communicate to a wide number of individuals where gestures are used in more one-on-one -on -one scenarios. Um, so asking to sort of receive food from another individual, asking to start grooming, um, a mother asking their infant to climb on their back, um, to solicit copulation, all of these sort of social activities that happen um, in a dyadic uh, context, in a dyadic interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, does gestural communication share any traits with other types of communication, like vocal communication and others? It's a, it's a good question. I think that it's one of those really interesting sort of um, history and philosophy of science questions where the people who have been studying gestures have been interested in one set of questions and the people who are studying vocalizations are interested in another set of questions. So in gestures, we've been asking questions around intentionality, um, around meaning, around flexibility um, and vocalizations also like to a certain extent, but they tend to ask more questions around syntax, look, talking about function rather than meaning. And there are a few studies that have started to look at intentionality. And we now think there may be more evidence, um, at least in great apes, that some of their vocalizations um, do meet criteria for intentionality. But the two sort of the two disciplines haven't been um, aligned in our questions um, so far, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, do we find the same kinds of gestures across different species or do we see, for example, an evolution in terms of the repertoire across species? Could there be a phylogenetic history of gestures or something like that? Yeah, um, my PhD research, we found that there was around a 90% overlap between the gesture types, the gesture repertoire used by wild bonobos at Wamba and wild chimpanzees at Badongo. I'm now part of a project where we're expanding on that. Uh, so we're looking at more groups of bonobos, more groups of chimpanzees, of gorillas, um, and of orangutans as well. We think there is this big overlap yeah. Um, at least in the gesture form. There also seems to be quite an overlap in the gesture meaning, but we're trying to build build that outwards into more populations and more species at the moment. Mm -hmm. And what does that tell us about, uh, I mean, how gestures develop? Are they innate or not? Yeah, there's sort of two schools of thought. Um, one is that gestures are ontogenetically ritualized, which broadly means that they start off as, as an actual action between two individuals, like an infant going to climb onto their mother's back. And through like repeated interactions, they become ritualized so that there becomes a point where the infant just reaches and the mother picks them up. Um, so that's one idea for how gestures um, could be acquired. Um, the other idea being um, that they are innate. Um, it's sort of very dichotomized into these two schools. 
but if the the large overlap of repertoire um, where we're seeing like 90% of the same gesture types used between bonobos and chimpanzees, if they were all being ontogenetically ritualized in this very sort of uh, repetitive complex process, we would expect to see more variation between individuals and also between groups and between species. Um, so we don't think that that's what's happening in all cases. It's it's very likely, and I think we're now sort of the generation below these two schools are now looking at ways where, of course, it's a mixture of there is some sort of capacity um, for gestures that all great apes have, um, but these might also be shaped by experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but do we see significant variation between different populations of the same species like bonobo, chimpanzees and others? I mean, uh, is there any gestural culture, let's say, that, that, that differs between populations? Um, there might be, but it would be sort of in the case of a few gesture types. Um, so there are some gestures, the bonobos um, at Wamba do a gesture um, where they drop leaves, they'll pick leaves and sort of drop them and throw them down. Um, and that was one of the gesture types where the chimpanzees that we compared them to, they did leaf clipping, which they would tear the leaves off um, to make these audible sort of sounds with the leaves. Um, and the bonobos didn't use that gesture. So we think that there might be some gesture types um, that vary by group. As a whole, they probably all have access to most of the gesture types. Also as an artifact of having the same body form um, and wanting to communicate about similar things in their social lives. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you study the meaning of each gesture? I mean, uh, how do you go about it? How do you know when a particular specimen or a particular individual performs a certain gesture? How do you know what he or her is referring to? Um, so we collect as much data as possible, um, filming as many social interactions as we can code those videos um, looking for gesture instances. Um, so of the 12 months I spent collecting data, I found around 4,000 gesture instances. And then in each of those cases, we look at how the recipient responds to the gesture. Um, so if I gave an arm raise gesture, um, and you passed me some food, then in that scenario, the arm raised gesture, the outcome of that um, is like, give me food, receive food. Um, so we look at all these instances, there's going to be hundreds of instances of arm raise. For some gestures, all of their instances, like they're always used to mean the same thing. Um, a big loud scratch gesture is always a request to initiate grooming. Um, but then the arm raise gesture, it had, I found, I think it was six meanings for the arm raise gesture. So some of them have a, an ambiguous set of meanings. Mm -hmm. So, and those that have an ambiguous set of meanings, I mean, it depends on the context, right? It does depend on the context. I um, have a paper coming out soon where we looked at exactly that um, because the the sort of the problem is if you have a signal that is ambiguous how how like how are you communicating your intended goal how does the recipient interpret that um so that you achieve what you intended and context does seem to play a big part so the information is sort of that there is additional information in context what were you doing before the gesture um and so an arm raise gesture um, when you're traveling or about to travel um, would be often a request for the infant to climb on, whereas an arm raised gesture um, while we're feeding is 
often a request for food. So the context does matter. Also, who is signaling to who is important? Are Is it a female bonobo signaling to another female or to a male, vice versa, a young individual signaling to an adult individual? Um, so context is hugely important in their communication as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're studying gestures in artificial settings and, for example, you teach animal sign language, can we learn something about the, how they naturally use gestures through those ways? Or is it that we get other kinds of insights by doing that? I think we get other kinds of insights. So it tells us that they can learn new gestures. And so there's no reason to think that their entire repertoire would be innate. They do have the ability to learn new gestures. They probably have the ability to change and modify the gestures that they're already using. So I think it informs it in that way. Um, it also tells us other sort of cognitive things about how they are able to combine signals or to um, interpret combinations of signals. Um, and so those studies are often used as sort of a, a way to experimentally assess their the cognition behind the communication because when we're filming and collecting data and then analyzing that data in wild great apes it's all observational and so we're sort of we're looking for behavioral cues um, without actually manipulating anything in their um, in their environment or in their lives mm -hmm. does the complexity of the repertoire of a given species has anything to do with the complexity of their sociality Oh, we think probably. Mm. Um, so they're the repertoire of gestures. Um, most great apes use around 70 gesture types, um, which is a, a much greater number than the vocalizations that they use. Um, we, as we're looking further back at other species of primates, um, there are some studies on um, baboons and on macaques. Um, we're interested in seeing how, like, how big is their repertoire? Are they deploying them in the same way? So that's hopefully something that we're going to be able to answer. Um, we certainly think that part of the evolution of human communication is sort of a growing social complexity and sort of the needs that come alongside that um, for communication tied in with our sort of with culture and cumulative culture and the ways in which we learn and teach. Mm -hmm. So in your research, if I'm not mistaken, you focus mostly on bonobos, right? Yeah, bonobos. Um, I've done some work with chimpanzees. Um, and yeah, we might do further work with chimpanzees in the future. Yeah. So what, what were some of the biggest insights you got from studying those species about gestural communication? Mm -hmm. The context was, I mean, so studying bonobos compared to chimpanzees really highlighted how um, context and social structures can impact on the gestures that individuals are using um, because bonobos, their group structures are very different to chimpanzees. Females really form the core of the group um, and they are interacting a lot more um, than at least East African chimpanzees, where the females tend to be much more peripheral. They're often only with their own infants. They'll join the group when they're in estrus, but really they tend to avoid um, the large the large parties. But the bonobos, they, well, first of all, they are most often in one group together. They don't fish in infusion to the same degree um, that chimpanzees do. Um, and mo so most members are present, they're all gesturing. So we're seeing more gestures used by female bonobos than we would by female chimpanzees. Um, and so I think it's, it's about that social network, about that context, um, and really highlights how much that shapes 
what we're seeing in how individuals are communicating. Mm -hmm. In bonobos, do we have female or male philopatry? And would that also influence uh, how they transmit their gestural repertoire? Well, bonobos and chimpanzees, it's both um, the females immigrate to a new group. Okay. But bonobos, when they immigrate to a new group, they become sort of a part of that group much uh, more readily. They There's a lot of female-female sexual behavior in bonobos. Um, it's called genitogenital rub rubbing, and they embrace and rub their genitals together. And we think this is a way of them to form stronger bonds with unrelated females. So they immigrate to a new group, they form relationships with the females in that group and the females will support one another. Um, there's really nice research by Nahoko Tokoyama looking at um, coalitions in bonobos where in uh, aggression between um, males and females, if the females form a coalition, they will defeat the male in 100% of instances. So this ability for female bonobos to form coalitions and to form stronger social bonds, um, we think has really impacted on this different social structure that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, can we extrapolate from these species to humans and get some new insights about how our own gesture, gestures might have evolved? Yeah, we're starting also to include humans in our research. Um, so uh, there, we're working with young infants, um, sort of under two years old and seeing what gestures they use. Um, there's a paper um, by Kerskin et al, uh, who found that uh, they, they found human infants to use around, I think it was around 80% of the gestures used by chimpanzees. Um, We've also conducted um, an online experiment where we show people videos of bonobo and chimpanzee gestures and ask them to assign meanings. And people seem to be better at that um, than would be expected by random chance. So we think that humans probably do retain some of this general great ape gestural communication. And sort of the capacities that come alongside that, the ability to use signals flexibly and intentionally was probably pivotal in language evolution um, and co-opted by our vocal system. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of gestural communication, do we know if humans use uh, more their hands than other species or not? I don't know that. Um... I mean, in general, humans gesture at a much greater rate because we're also gesturing for additional things. Um, and so I suppose in some, we probably do use our hands more. Um, one of the marked differences between humans and other great apes is how much we point. Yeah. So there is some evidence that chimpanzees and other great apes point, um, but it's quite limited and it often seems to be, so it's more common in captivity where they've interacted with people and probably seen people pointing. Um, in the wild, there's very little um, evidence of these sort of dictic signals, but humans point all the time. Infants start pointing from a really young age. It seems to be really important in how we acquire language and communicate cooperatively. So pointing is a huge, a huge um, species difference for humans. Obviously, we also learn a load of conventional gestures um, and we gesture alongside speech, alongside um, sign language. Um, we gesture to help us think through things. Like if I'm if I am like looking for the scissors, I'll walk around like making scissor gestures. Um, we're, we're very like, we use gestures in sort of a multitude of additional ways as well. Mm -hmm. uh, can we say that any other species apart from Homo sapiens uh, has intentional communication? Yeah, so I think the great ape gestures um, show strong evidence of intentional communication. Um, we 
measure that by looking at a variety of things, which actually follows stricter criteria than we use for people. We just sort of assume intentionality in all uh, human communication, regardless of whether or not it's um, it's there. Um, in infant studies, for example, eye gaze is taken, if you're looking at an individual, you're communicating intentionally with them, that's enough for developmental studies. Um, but for grade eight research, um, eye gaze like isn't enough. And if we just say this individual was looking at another individual when they gave a gesture, that's not enough for for other psychologists um, to believe that it's intentional communication. We do use, um, so it needs to be, gestures need to be used um, socially, so they need to be directed at another individual. They do need to look at that individual um, and um, choose or use, deploy a gesture that's appropriate to that individual's attentional state. So if they're looking at you, you can use a silent visual gesture, but if they're not, you should use a contact gesture or an audible gesture. Um, is there response waiting, um, which indicates that they are expecting the recipient to respond and so they wait for it. And if they don't get a response, they persist with the same gesture, they elaborate with a new gesture. Um, and finally, if they do get a response, they'll stop gesturing um, and carry on with that response. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this whole set of criteria for non-human species that we don't actually apply um, or developmental psychologists don't often apply to humans. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, do you also try to understand what goes around in their minds while they're gesturing? I mean, th does, does it matter to you the kinds of perhaps mental representations they make? Yeah, it does. And it's a really difficult question. And that's why we're sort of, it's, it's not only enough for the recipient to change their behavior, we're also asking, does the signaler seem to be satisfied with that change in behavior? Um, because if the recipient changes their behavior and does something else, um, that, that that wasn't the signaler's intended goal, um, we would expect the signaler to continue gesturing, continue communicating. Um, so we're trying to get at that as well. I think one of the one of the things that's missing from our current methods is what's happening in the cases where we don't get a response. Um, so obviously a huge number of those is probably that the recipient just doesn't want to do it. Um, but we also wouldn't be able to pick up on gestures that mean like keep doing exactly what you're doing. Like that's great, just keep doing that. We also wouldn't be able to pick up on declarative gestures or gestures that are about something else like, oh, look at that tree over there or this fruit tastes delicious. Um, something that you wouldn't expect a response from in those unsuccess unsuccessful instances where we don't see a change in behavior. There's sort of, there are further questions that we currently, I mean, it's a methodological puzzle, how to address those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my last question will be about that. So what are the kinds of questions that you are exploring now? I, so that's so those unsuccessful gestures unsuccessful um gestures i find to be really interesting i think one of the questions um that comes out of that is can a recipient misunderstand the signaler do we see misunderstanding in this gestural communication do they always know how to respond um what happens when they're not responding correctly correctly. Um, I think there's a whole lot around that um, because sort of if we're expecting gestures, if we have this sort of intentional system in which gestures have meanings, well meanings can be misunderstood. And so if you just always know a sort of immediately that this gesture elicits this response, you, you, 
misunderstanding doesn't come into that interpretation as much, where if a recipient is actually interpreting the signaler, understanding them, then that also leaves room for misunderstanding. I think that's a really interesting, big question that I'll probably spend, <laughs> a, a, yeah, a good few years, uh, uh, <laughs> potentially the rest of my career looking at. <laughs> yeah, uh, by the way, are you also interested in deception in any way? Because, I mean, could there, could it be the case that some species also use gestures deceptively yeah i think that's really interesting too um because of the flexibility and intentional usage that also leaves room for deception yeah yeah okay so dr graham let's end the interview here just before we go would you like to mention some places on the internet where people can find your work um, you can follow me on Twitter at Kirsty E. Graham. Um, I have a blog that sometimes I write in. <laughs> um, that's KirstyEmmaGraham.com. Um, yeah, and you can probably find other ways of contacting me through either of those platforms. Okay, great. So, Dr. Graham, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was really great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing this channel for three years, bringing you top academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Even one dollar would already be a great help. Otherwise, you also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. And please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button if you liked the interview. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollisey, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windager, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Cory Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Librant, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Staten T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adaner Usmani, my, pro my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Franz, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.